Three scriptures that were to become the foundation stones of his ministry, Zechariah 4.6, Acts 2.47, and Ephesians 4.11-16, helped Chuck make a clean break with the Foursquare denomination. He began pastoring a small independent church in Corona, California. And within a year of practical, expositional Bible teaching, the church experienced phenomenal growth, forcing a move to a larger building. About this same time, 1965, Chuck was offered the pastorate of a tiny, floundering church of 25 people in Costa Mesa, California, called Calvary Chapel. In fact, the small congregation was praying to determine if they should continue as a church as their pastor was soon retiring. Trusting that God was leading him to take the pastorate of the struggling little church, Chuck became excited about the possibilities for the kingdom of God that this new venture in faith could bring. He was also reminded of two prophecies the Lord had given him a couple of years earlier. One, that the Lord would bless his ministry to a degree that there would not be enough room to hold all of the people who would come. And two, that God would make him a shepherd of many flocks. Uh, I found that in the Horn Fellowships, Mike, you can sit and teach for an hour. And people will still be sitting very attentive, asking questions, and they'll go on for another hour just asking questions. You try and hold them that long in church in a regimented kind of a thing, and after a half hour they start to squirm and all. And so uh, you could spend you can spend so much more time, and it's more of a uh, dialogue kind of rather than lecture teaching. The people have a, a chance to interact, to ask questions, a freedom to ask the questions. And so the learning curve goes way up in a home Bible study group. Part of the success of Calvary Chapel in holding on to its members, I believe, can be attributed to the fact that there is a very active home fellowship program in all the Calvary Chapels with which I'm familiar. And I think the ability to meet in a small group with 15 or 20 people to study the Bible, to pray, and to experience that very direct human contact with other people that is not experienced in a large group meeting with three or four thousand, I think that's part of the key of incorporation. I feel that uh, it's a great way to teach the Word and to study the Word and to get people interested in the practical application of living the Word because it's got to be lived in the home. You know, and, and it, when they are being taught in the home, they get more the idea of it being lived out in the home uh, rather than uh, separating the, here's, now I, this is me in church, but this is me in the home, you know. Right. And rather than the dichotomy, they realize that, hey, it's right here in the home. I worship God right here in my home. I learn of God right here in my home. And, and you know, I can praise the Lord right here in my home and it brings it right within the home. As Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Chuck faithfully continued his expositional teaching, taking his new congregation through the entire Bible in two years by averaging 10 chapters a week. The result was the beginning of the fulfillment of one of the prophecies that he had been given. His church could not hold all the people who were coming. Had Chuck and Kay not obeyed the calling of God to do something that seemed totally foolish by man's standards, they would have missed an outpouring of God's Holy Spirit unprecedented in modern times. The timing was perfect, though, for the move to Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa, because the timing was God's. The 1960s brought tremendous embarrassment and chaos to our nation, politically, morally, and spiritually. America witnessed three cold-blooded assassinations and watched their children burn themselves out searching for peace on hallucinogenic drugs and stood by helplessly as its next generation threw all moral and spiritual values at the feet of Eastern mystics. Despite his animosity toward a biblical God, Beatle John Lennon's truthful observation of modern society proved to be far more accurate than we cared to admit at the time. I wasn't knocking it or putting it down, I was just saying it was a fact. And it sort of, it is true, especially more for England than here. No, but I'm not saying that we're better or greater or comparing us with Jesus Christ as a person or God as a thing or whatever it is. You know, I just said what I said and it was wrong or was taken wrong and now it's all this. The all of this 
to which Lenin referred was the uproar that he had caused by forcing Western society to take a good hard look at its decaying morals and values. It seemed that for every giant step forward that man made technologically, he took three giant leaps backward spiritually. The atrocities of an unpopular war and the angry growls of the spiritual hunger pangs of America's youth finally made their way to God's throne. I came from a, a family where I, I just didn't get any love and I needed it and so I tried to get it from my friends and they were on drugs so I thought I might get accepted by getting into drugs too. And I got sort of caught up into the whole thing that was happening with the lyrics from the Beatles and just about the time I started taking drugs, Sergeant Pepper came out and I was looking to all these, these men for answers and uh, trying to follow this path of the way hippies were going, you know, I sold all my possessions and I went to Hawaii. I could be in the middle of a crowd and feel so alone, just so unwanted and unrecognized and so insecure. And it's just a, a deep, hollow feeling, just one that would drive me to anything to fill it, anything. I remember that uh, over, particularly in Arizona and Oregon, in a number of places, young people just left the uh, establishment areas and went out into the woods, into the desert to uh, rethink their lives. And of course, some of these uh, adopted uh, lifestyles and uh, dress styles that were a little offensive to the establishment. And of course, many of the churches felt a little uncomfortable with these young people, even if they had uh, reached any of them. My feeling was sort of, you know, turned off, I, dirty hippies kind of attitude towards them, you know, and why don't you get a job and why don't you cut your hair kind of a attitude, you know, and, and uh, it was Kay really that had the real uh, burden for these young people. The one thing I can remember is just being fascinated by them because we had three kids in high school and I thought, why are they dropping out right now? What's, what's going on in their life? And I'd see them roaming the streets or wherever I saw them, I would start crying. And we'd be with people and they'd go, oh, those dirty hippies, how can they bust at that? And I'd cry. And I used to beg Chuck to take me to Huntington Beach so we could just sit and watch the hippies. And I remember I started praying and saying, God, what's wrong? What is, what, what's going on? What's wrong with their lives? And I felt the Lord said to me, they're empty, they need me. Many at the time in the 60s, uh, they were born to families where the fathers had come back from the war, gotten the age of technology, mass production, a whole technical world was emerging and people were becoming very successful around the country. There was just a tremendous growth in the uh, uh, gross national product. People were buying big homes, they were enjoying cars, they were enjoying a lifestyle never before known in this country. And yet the youth of those families were, were empty. I began to catch the burden from her and just uh, beginning to pray for these kids and, and seeking God for some way uh, to cross this generation gap and to cross this uh, establishment, anti-establishment gap. I mean, they were, they were so far from us. How do you even start to communicate with them? And then I became passionate to meet one and uh, told everybody, if you ever, you know, can get a hippie to our house, bring one over. And my daughter started, Jeanette, started dating a boy that had been a hippie in Haight-Ashbury. And that was the beginning of our first meeting, um, someone who had been a hippie. So he, he one night came to the door with an honest-to-goodness hippie. <laughs> and so uh, we were so taken in that um, we invited this young fellow to stay with us and soon he invited all of his friends and we had about 10 or 12 kids mm. that were uh, putting their sleeping bags all over the house and he started bringing kids over and baptizing them in the pool in the backyard and uh, we had a dough boy back there and he would bring kids over to baptize that he'd witnessed to on the streets. One of the young men, Catherine, who has been so used of God is Lonnie Frisbee and I wonder if Lonnie could just share with us some now. Well, the people tell me that I'm trying to look like Jesus. I can't think of anybody else I'd rather look like. <laughs> Jesus, he changed my life. 
And I, I kind of relate it to like David the psalmist when he says that thou hast lifted me up from the dung hill and he has placed my feet on a solid rock. He raises up a person that, is, that, that understands these things in a sense and is going to put his own life at great risk to do it. Something where Alan Redpath used to say that God, if he wanted, he could write the gospel in the sky. He could speak it in the thunder of his own voice, but he has chosen to use people. But primarily, he always wants somebody that's willing to put their life at risk. And that's one of the things Chuck did. His reputation with these kids and wild Orange County newspapers and magazines and, and television stations, they were coming and saying, uh, this is a fluke, this is weird, these kids, and it's they're ter terribly unstable. Chuck was willing to, to go out and put his own life on the line. Rather than making the emphasis upon the changes outwardly, we were emphasizing the inward change that is necessary. And let the Lord take care of the outward. Uh, you know, that uh, it's what's going on in a person's heart. There is no doubt that he was used to rescue thousands of these young people and uh, win them to the Lord. When Chuck was uh, confronted with this, he welcomed them with open arms. And uh, so one brought another and others until uh, several long pews in Chuck's church were filled with these young people from the beach area. And it wasn't long until they were baptizing as many as 500 at Corona Del Mar uh, who had accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. The baptism by full immersion is a very important step in their faith. Many of these young people that you see have had rather sordid backgrounds, Catherine. They've been in drugs, they've been in prostitution, they've been in everything you could possibly think about. Baptism in the Christian sense actually signifies a burying of the old life. It's the end of the road for the old man, and so many times as I'm walking out into the water, I'll say to the young person, well, this is the end of the road. <laughs> We're going to bury all of the past. If any man's in Christ, he's a new creature, and they'll say, wow, far out, oh, let's bury it, you know. <laughs> I even had one young man the other day say, hold me down a long time, Chuck, I've got a lot to bury. You know? but there was a tre tremendous availability to say, God, how do you want to do this? We're open to anything. And there was a new, a new music, there was a new way, there was a new current uh, that hadn't really ever been tested before. There was something that God put it in, and he, and, and he moved it, and He raised it up. And the secret wasn't so much in the process, but in the attitude to, God, get us out of the way, and you do it. We're going into country that's never been ventured into, but we believe you're there, and you're leading us sovereignly to do it. Calvary Chapel was right in the mainstream of reaching those people. And I think because of that, they endured a great deal of criticism. Uh, both from charismatic and non-charismatic. Uh, some of the mainline Pentecostal churches were very threatened by Calvary Chapel and uh, what they were doing. In uh, the early 70s, I was a skeptic, okay, because I was a traditional pastor in a traditional fundamental church, uh, and we weren't sure that God should be let out of a box. And in the churches I pastored, uh, whenever we talked of things of the Holy Spirit, we had to be very careful that we were really orthodox in our thinking. The early church was directed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit said to Paul, now don't go over to Asia. And uh, the, the Spirit led them, and the Spirit said, separate me, Paul and Barnabas. And it was directed by the Spirit. And uh, none of these things, we, set, we didn't sit down and have strategy sessions and say, well, now how can we reach them, and how can we grow, and what can we do here? And, and all these planning sessions, it was just something that just naturally happened. As you follow the leading of the Spirit, you just stumble into it and, and you find yourself right in the middle of, of God working and that's always an exciting place to be. And I walked into this church crammed full of people, some 2,000 people. They were in the pews, sitting on the floor, standing on the sides. The place was overflowing. And I was overwhelmed by it all, to be honest with you. The thing that caught my eye when I went to Calvary Chapel was not only the excitement that was there, but the people actually believed what the message was and were living it. I've been to churches before that time my whole life, and I never 
got the impression that the people in the church actually believe what was being preached. These people actually believed it. In one night, a man sat in front of me, about 22 years old, about my age, who had epileptic seizures, and he went up and asked the elders to pray for him and said, I believe Jesus can heal me. And they took James 5, literally, that if there's any sick or afflicted, let them call for the elders of the church. They'll anoint him with oil, and uh, that person will be healed. And I saw, I literally saw that man's faith. And this little voice said to me, what about you? You think you're dead. You're not even sure if you're alive. And if I can do it physically, I could do a mental healing. So I went to Chuck, and I told him what I had experienced, and they prayed for me. And that night, I was instantly healed of all the neurological, psychological, and any brain damage that I had done to the brain cells because of the excessive use of LSD. All of us, of course, a uh, bunch of kids, you know, all of us really uh, uh, right in the middle of something exciting, having no idea what we're doing and uh, looking back on it. Uh, and yet the Lord amazingly with His mercy and His hand upon it. It was just a, a supernatural thing in most every sense of the word. The young people were just interested in the Bible and praising God in music. Uh, they showed more love. They taught me those so-called hippies, taught me love. They took you just like you were. They even wrote a song, love song, wrote a song, uh, little country shirt, shirt, little country church. And uh, it said, uh, short hair, long hair, uh, looking past all of that into each other's eyes. And it was just a lot of love, still is, but just a lot of love. And it, it just blew people away, still does. It's very plain to see It's not the way it used to be Preacher isn't talking about religion no more He just wants to praise the Lord People aren't as stuffy as they were before They just want to praise the Lord And it's very plain It's not the way it used to be Their 